Okay, here we're going to talk about representation of a function by a series of orthogonal functions. And mainly what we're doing is, uh, the point of this is we want to find a formula for the coefficients, uh, our, our c sub n's, in terms of f of x and our orthogonal functions. So that's the basic idea. Uh, we have this series expansion. We want to somehow get a formula for our coefficients. Okay, so... Um, so let's let's state it all here real quick, and then we'll we'll justify the result. Um, and we're going to omit a couple of the technical details um, just because they get really kind of hairy to show. And uh, but I just want to give sort of a brief outline of how we uh, where we get this formula for the coefficients. And again, this is the formula that you're going to use when you find the coefficients of a Fourier series. So that's the whole reason why I'm doing it, just to justify where those coefficients in a Fourier series come from. Okay, so suppose f of x is a piecewise differentiable uh, function, a piecewise differentiable function on the interval a to b, and that f of x um, is the summation from n equals 1 to infinity of c sub n times phi sub n of x. And our phi sub n of x, that's going to be an orthogonal set of functions. So recall an orthogonal set of functions just says if we take two distinct members and we calculate their inner product, we get 0. Um, so that's an orthogonal set of functions on the interval, closed interval a to b. It says then the formula for c sub n, it says what we do is we take the inner product of f and phi sub n, we divide that by the inner product of phi sub n and phi sub n, and, and then just the formula for the inner product on the right side. So we're going to justify this formula at the bottom. Okay, so again, shouldn't be uh, too bad since we're going to leave out a couple of the details, but again, just a rough idea on, you know, why this works. So uh, let me state what I said again just one more time here. So the coefficients of a series with respect to an orthogonal set, these have a useful form. And basically, by useful form, it says we can produce a formula for them. So we've got an orthogonal set of functions on a to b, closed interval a to b. f of x is just going to be, again, from n equals 1 to infinity of c sub n times phi sub n of x. And again, our whole goal here is to find a formula for the coefficients c sub n in terms of f of x and the orthogonal functions uh, phi sub n of x. Okay. So, well, let's show this real quick. Okay, so one thing, you know, we should really discuss and we're going to kind of glaze over is in what sense does this series actually converge? And um, that's going to be one thing that's important that we're going to kind of glaze over. And the other thing is, uh, well, I'll point it out to you. Okay, so again, we've got that f of x. So again, just a rough little proof, uh, a rough little outline of why we can find the coefficients the way we do. So f of x is going to be c sub n times phi sub n of x. And what we're going to do is we're just going to pick some um, phi sub m of x. We're just going to pick one of those uh, orthogonal functions, or one of those functions from our orthogonal set. Okay, so we're just going to pick one of those. And we're going to find the inner product. We're just going to find the inner product with our function f of x. Okay, well... So we've got f and phi sub m. Again, that's just our notation for the inner product. To calculate the inner product, we integrate uh, over the definite, or excuse me, over the interval a to b, and we just take f of x times phi sub m of x dx. Okay, so now all I'm going to do is I'm just going to replace. I'm going to replace f of x with our definition. So it says f of x is the summation from n equals 1 to infinity. Um, and we've got c sub n times phi sub n of x. And then again, we're just multiplying all that by phi sub m of x. And then we, again, well, we're just integrating that with respect to x. Okay, so obviously, you know, you know I don't know, this is probably not even a step worth writing down. Um, you can clearly distribute the phi sub m to each one here. So we have c sub n times phi sub n 
of x, v sub m of x dx. Okay, so now one thing, uh, and probably really the most, one of the other important things I said that we're going to sort of glaze over here, is we're going to interchange the summation and the integration. And, you know, I guess sort of one question would be, is it valid to do that? Well, it turns out that it is. So we've got from n equals 1 to infinity, the integral from a to b, we have c sub n times v sub n of x times v sub m of x dx. And now what we're going to recognize is, you know, if you were to expand, if you were to expand all of this out, and maybe I'll write out a few terms here just so you, again, you can see it. Um, if we were to expand all the, all of this out, we would have the integral from a to b, we would have, well, c sub 1 times v sub 1 of x times our phi sub m of x dx. And then we would have the integral from a to b, and now we would have c sub, c sub 2, phi sub 2 of x, um, and then phi sub m of x dx. And, you know, we would keep doing this. Eventually, somewhere in there, we would have the integral from a to b of c sub m, phi sub m of x, and then or another v sub m of x dx. And again, we would just keep expanding this. Uh, you know, it goes from n equals 1 to infinity. So this would keep going on and on and on and on. Okay, the thing to recognize again, though, is um, our, our we, we're dealing with an orthogonal set of functions. So our orthogonal set of functions, recall that says that the inner product is going to equal 0 for distinct members. So you could always pull the constant out, c sub 1. Um, but our inner product here, uh, when we calculate this, this whole integral, since they're orthogonal, since they're orthogonal, this integral is simply going to equal 0. Likewise, our next integral would also equal 0. Again, assuming that, you know, the, our generic m value is not equal to 2. The only one of these uh, definite integrals that won't equal 0 will be the one I've got written here. Okay. Okay, so that's one thing to notice in this case. So the idea is that um, the only thing that we're going to be left with in this case is going to be our constant c sub m times the integral of a to b from, or excuse me, of phi to m, phi sub m of x times phi sub m of x dx. And that just says we have c sub m times, well, the inner product of phi sub m of x, phi sub m of x. Okay, just to use our inner product notation. So now we are basically done. Okay, we've now, um, again, by, by sort of uh, glazing over a couple of those issues, we've, we've got what we wanted to. So we started with our inner product um, of f and phi sub m, and okay, so now to get the value for c sub m, we can just simply divide both sides. So that says that the, to get the coefficient c sub m, we'll just take the inner product of f and our function phi sub m, and again, just divide it by the inner product of phi sub m and phi sub m, and again, just by definition of an inner product, if we want to write out uh, the definition of our inner product here, it says that we now it says that we now have the result that we wanted to show. Okay, so I almost wrote f of x down there again. Sorry about that. So again, this is just phi sub m and phi sub m. And that's exactly where to go. That's exactly what we set out to show at the beginning. Okay, so we started off with n's instead of m's. Who cares? Uh, same idea. So uh, we've now got the formula that we wanted. So, and this is going to be useful because, again, you know, when we start talking about Fourier series, for example, we're going to be interested in calculating these coefficients and to produce sort of a generic formula to help you calculate these coefficients, we're going to, going to use exactly um, 
this this nice result.